Well, a, a shift in focus to uh, Southeast Asia and away from history and a, uh, a narrative of, of current events. Uh, let's see. Back next. I'm going to begin today, first of all, with uh, talking about all of the uh, contributors to this project. This is a project that's been funded by NSF and NASA. And we were working in three countries, and in China, Xu Zhangshu has been one of our chief collaborators. But of course, uh, here we've had Nick Menzies, and he's referred to the work of Janet Sturgeon and others. Thailand, I'm very dependent on the work of David Thomas uh, with the World Agroforestry Center, but also Bejin Pan Eka Singh, a, 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 an economist. Lao Kam, uh, Kamla Pandilai is a, a Lao forester who is a lecturer at the National University of Lao, but he's getting a PhD with us in, at the University of Hawaii. And Yayoi Fujita, who's been with us. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about the hydrology, the, uh, some of our results from that, and these have been people from the University of Hawaii. Uh, of course, let me start in oppos opposition to uh, Christine. Anything that I say that is correct is due to them, <laughs> any of the mistakes are due to me. Um, <laughs> This is the er this area is of course the area that's been known as the Golden Triangle. It is a, a remote mountainous area of Southeast Asia, uh, and today a new road has been built across it, Route Three, which links Kunming to Chiang Mai, but basically links Beijing to Singapore. It opens up a north-south corridor for all of Asia, um, and we were funded by NSF and NASA to look at. Uh, some of the environmental and uh, livelihood implications of this road. More specifically, the NASA-funded project simulated land cover and land use change in the region and modeled how these changes would affect local and regional energy and moisture fluxes and the consequences of those changes for continental scale atmospheric circulation and climate. And the NSF-funded work examined the political, economic, and social drivers of these changes and their implications for people's livelihoods. At the end of World War II, the landscape along this corridor and the daily lives of its inhabitants were relatively similar. Shifting cultivation had been practiced at least for a millennium, at least that's what I had read until I heard differently maybe today, and had greatly influenced land cover and land use across this transect. Most people tended to be defined and to define themselves as ethnic minorities. Over the last six centuries, however, these countries have been under vastly different economic and political regimes, and these differences have influenced land use and land cover in the region today. Thailand has an open market and democratic government. Thailand has never experienced any period of land collectivization and has been the most reluctant of the three nations to provide any form of legal recognition of land title on sloping lands. China and Lao are socialist states that have differed in the timing and ways in which they opened their economies to the world markets and provided private and usufruct rights to natural resources. Um, so in today's talk, then, I want to examine narratives of, of, from the three areas on, and an assortment of government policies affected land use and land covers in these countries. Uh, land use and land cover change are often viewed through two broadly defined issues, those of structure and agency. In this paper, I highlight the role of those played by the structural variables, state policies and markets. Uh, policies, of course, though, do not exist in, in isolation, and human agency plays an important how, role in, in how land is used. In, um, in, okay. So, uh, in China, our work focuses on Xishanbana. You heard about the area yesterday from Nick. Uh, it is the most southern prefecture in Yunnan, and it borders both Laos and Bur Burma. And uh, we've worked in uh, both Menghai and Meng uh, Mengla County. There's rubber grown in all three ends, as well as Jinghong Township. Um, in response to the military needs highlighted by the Korean War, as Nick mentioned, the Chinese Central Committee introduced rubber to Shishangbana in the early 50s as a strategic industrial product to be produced on a large-scale collective farms. Um, and they brought in various forms of labor over the years, culminating with a wave of state, um, of state farm workers arriving during the Cultural Revolution when educated youth from the cities were sent to rural areas. It's estimated that perhaps over 100,000 youth were sent between 68 and 78. 
uh, throughout the period when the state's farms were being established, the local minority farmers labored on agricultural communes. But in 1982, the Chinese government dismantled the farming communes and turned farming households into entrepreneurs. Farmers received commune lands but needed to pay for educational, health, and local services once provided by the communes. The farmers' needs for cash caused them to convert their lands to commercial crops, lowlands became wet rice fields, and uplands were used for livestock. But a major state campaign encouraged upland farmers to plant rubber at elevations below 700 meters in fields used for swiddening. State farm personnel provided seedling and technical training. After 2002, the incentive for planting rubber became even stronger. A new Grain for Green campaign provided farmers with grain for eight years if they planted forest cover on degraded slopes. In Shishangbana, the authorities decided to count rubber trees as forest cover. And about the same time, a rapid rise in rubber prices occurred. So eager for wealth, households began planting rubber in their traditional woodlots, in village forests, and on the remaining and steeper slopes. Below 700 meters, but even higher, rubber became ubiquitous. And this is a slide of Janet Sturgeon, actually on the Lao border looking north towards China. I believe Nick used it as well yesterday, but he attributed to her. Uh, today, rubber farmers in Shishangbana have achieved unprecedented wealth. Janet Sturgeon quotes an Aka rubber farmer as noting that money is the most important thing. Money makes everything possible. That everything includes sending their children to high school, buying insurance for retirement and health care, and even a holiday in the city. Indeed, Sturgeon argues that ethnic minority rubber farmers in Shishangbana have achieved a standard of living today that has more in common with middle class urban residents than with most fellow farmers. The exact reason for the success of these farmers, other than the price of rubber, is not totally clear, or at least to me. We speculate that it has to deal with clear tenure rights, the long-term leases that the Chinese provide to both agriculture and forest lands, to individuals, to individual households. Uh, previous knowledge about how to grow rubber gained from working on the state farms or from relatives and friends who have worked on them the existence of the infrastructure necessary for collecting and processing rubber, and perhaps a relatively sophisticated population in comparison with ethnic minority population elsewhere in mainland Southeast Asia. But regardless of the reason, many small ethnic minority farmers have become financially successful. The environmental implications of the story, however, are less positive. Shishangbana has the highest biodiversity by far in China and is included in the Indo-Burma Biodiversity Hotspot. Uh, the Chinese government has set aside approximately 240,000 hectares, about 12% of the prefecture as a biosphere reserve. But as I've said, almost all land that's not in the reserve, and I'm sure some that is, that lies between 400 and 1,100 meters has basically been converted to rubber. Now, in our own work, oh, you can't, hey, I'm going to get closer to the mic. Um, the hydrological implications of rubber are also not benign. Based on long-term observations, Liu showed a negative relationship between the presence of fog and the increase of rubber plantations, and Wu et al. showed that surface runoff increased by a factor of three and soil erosion increased by a factor of 45 as, as a result of conversion from tropical forest to monocultural rubber. Our, well, let me just talk about this. In our NASA-funded work, and how, how do you do the red thing? Okay. Uh, we built towers over four different types of land, uh, land cover, TE, grassland, secondary forest, and rubber. Observed them for one year before they were rudely jerked out by the Chinese authorities and observed that during the dry season, uh, most forms of vegetation declined in the amount of water they were taking from the deep groundwater sources, whereas rubber at the very end of the dry season begins to peak. And we're going to explore this more, um, but it suggests, well, the bigger story is actually rubber, of course, is an introduction from the Amazon. There's been recent uh, studies in the Amazon that suggest that the onset of the rainy season is driven by, the, by these uh, deciduous trees that begin to flush, begin to uh, take groundwater from deep sources, and uh, put, put evapotranspirate into the atmosphere. We've taken that tree now, one of those trees, and put it into a different environment, 
uh, where it's behaving in a different way and you convert the whole landscape to rubber, you will probably begin to have water shortages uh, during the dry season. Um, now, our work in Lao was conducted, as Yaoi told you yesterday, in the two pro most of northern provinces, uh, uh, Luang Nam Ta and Bo Kheo. Uh, Kam La has been working in both uh, provinces, and p particularly in the Tseng district. Across the border in northern Lao, a different story has unfolded. Uh, Post-war uh, political insecurity until the mid-80s prevented active development efforts in the uplands. In the 90s, the Lao government introduced a measure to mark Cape Forest and protected areas. 96, the National Land and Forest Allocation Policy was proclaimed. And this policy supported the delineation of village boundaries. They actually go out and map village boundaries with the farmers and recognize villagers' rights to manage and use forest resources as well as forest rights to use agricultural land. But one of their chief objectives, of course, is to stop shifting cultivation. And then in the, well, earlier, in the 80s, they began to liberalize the markets and to promote uh, private sector activities. This was followed by the removal of agricultural price regulations, production quotas, agricultural taxes, actions which allowed farmers to sell their products freely. In the early 90s, the government opened international borders with neighboring countries and began to construct improved roads. Now, these changes launched new economic opportunities and, re and released an influx of people and goods. Chinese investors initiated new projects, included investments with relatives, they have relatives across the border, and the Chinese national government program, as shown in this slide, provided um, Chinese companies with subsidies to invest in, in uh, crops that could be used to eradicate opium. So under the guise of opium eradication, these investors supplied Lao farmers with planting materials uh, with ranging from rice and watermelon, chilin, chilies and pumpkins in the lowlands to mice, maize and sugarcane and rubber, as Yayo was telling about yesterday. These incentives also created wage labor, labor opportunities in areas where cash crop production became prominent uh, and encouraged more households to move downwards. Um, now, Kamla, our graduate student, had documented the expansion of rubber in an Aka village on the Lao side of the Lao-China border. He found pioneer settlers first planted rubber in 1944, in 1994-95. Now this is interesting because the Chinese first started planting in 82. That became productive around 90. These people have relatives across the border, so they're learning from their relatives in 90, 92 or so, and begin planning in 94. Now I've told you about Lao policy, and Lao policy clearly is setting a groundwork for being able to do rubber, but the Lao government authorities never meant for these people to grow rubber. But it's the policy changes in China that actually leads to, to the change in land use in, in, in Lao. Uh, now, the, these trees began becoming productive in 90, 90, 94, 95, and these early adopters planted the crop because they had gained experience from their neighbor, from their relatives. Uh, but, um, okay. Well, well, the point I want to make is that in the first couple, the, 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 the Lao farmers that planted in the first few waves, 94, 95, began to get wealthy off that. Then other followers, other planters, farmers began to plant as well. Well, they were less well situated by then to take uh, advantage of it and began to sell some of their land to the first uh, providers and become laborers on their land. Now, this has been documented in other stories as well, and it's not always a, an outright sell. It could be sharecropping. There are different kinds of sharecropping. But there's definitely a thing going on here where people are beginning to, to lose rights to their lands. So while farmers in the village observed by Kamla have a land and forest allocation plan, they do not have formalized land titling but an informal land network does exist, and we're beginning to get the selling of this land. Uh, and the village committee that is responsible for implementing the land and forest allocation plan is under significant pressure to help poor households find additional land for agricultural production. This is also part of the story. We're at the end of the forest frontier. Farmers think, oh, I've always had Sweden cultivation land. I'll sell off my rubber and go further. 
Well, this is no longer necessarily an opportunity. There are still places, particularly in Laos, where it will exist, but we are at the end of this forest frontier. Um, and more significantly in this village, but it's true for elsewhere, in 2007, the Lao military and a private company as well both planted in excess of 200 hectares of, ray, of rubber within the village boundaries. So there are more pressures as well. A key, a key input in rubber cultivation is labor, with plantations expanding beyond local labor capacity. Labor uh, shortages have occurred. Migration both internally from other parts of northern Laos as well as from China is already underway and will continue to rise in the coming years. Um, land use change is changing, land use is changing rapidly in northern Laos, reflecting broader patterns operating in other parts of the uplands of Southeast Asia. The commercialization of farming systems has created a new source of income for many families, while at the same time simulating land markets and accelerating, accelerating land alienation. Unlike in neighboring Shishangbana, where land use and tenure policies are clear and communities have maintained legal rights to their land, some communities in nor northern Laos are selling their land and beginning to experience a chaotic pattern of land use and tenure change. Uh, the environmental implications of land cover and change in northern Laos are not quite clear yet. This is Sitong's uh, work. Uh, yeah, you always showed this yesterday, the decrease in dense forests, but an expansion of secondary forests, but overall a slight decrease, about 7% in forest cover, and an increase, of course, in this lowland agriculture, as well in these different forms of agriculture, which are primarily commercial crops nowadays. So let's go finally to Thailand, which is a int very interesting story as well. First of all, uh, we're working with David Thomas. We're working in the Ping River Basin, which is these five provinces, uh, provinces. We're not working in the Mekong, which is right up here on the border. The Ping it flows into the Chao Phaya, which flows into Bangkok, the source of all power. So the, Ch the Thai authorities, since the early 60s, have been very concerned about land use in the Ping Basin. Um, and because of that, they be large um, parts of the, these areas were set aside, uh, and go on to the next slide actually, as protected areas, either as, as act uh, right protected or areas or protected watersheds. And so this slide shows that if you look Thailand overall, about 26% of the landscape has been locked up in protected areas. If you look in the northern half the landscape, and if you look at specific watersheds in the Ping, you're up to 90% of the landscape. Um, so in addition to constraints on land use practices, people living on these protected lands are not eligible to apply for land tenure documents. Most people in the Midlands and Highland zones of Northern Thailand have no form of official recognition of their rights to use land for any purpose whatsoever. Um, an interesting thing has happened though. I mean, there are, uh, uh, although land use is officially forbidden, is heavily restricted to most upland areas, many forms of land use are present and are continuing to evolve, and this means, of course, that uh, we have conflict between those sanctioned by local authorities and by government institutions. Now, the Royal Foundation, the Royal Project Foundation, set up by the king in the early, in 69, uh, promoted new crops to replace opium. Uh, this is also very interesting. Uh, this is just some of the examples of it. And these included vegetable, flower, and fruit crops. But they have been very successful in, um, in producing diversified crops, uh, creating outlets and shops and a brand name. Uh, technical assistance has been contributed uh, with, from private sectors. Uh, and resulting lines of products are being sold to the elite in, in Bangkok. So one of the least discussed but perhaps most important aspects of what has happened by the Royal Project Foundation has they, they have accomplished an established of system and operations that are generic enough that the same facilities can be, and systems can be used for a relatively diverse and evolving set of product lines rather than the single commodity chains that we are seeing elsewhere. So in summary then, uh, oh, this is interesting. This is. Um, Again, I, I do want to make this point. Of course, because of this, the protected area, we've had an increase in the protected crops. We've had a loss of the forest fallow, and we've had an increase in, in the permanent fields. So in terms of the environmental services, what does this mean? 
what does this, what is, and there's been, there's been no large scale survey of an increase in forest cover in northern Thailand. I think something needs to be done there. But even perhaps more important, nothing is known about the ecology of this or the, lo or the biodiversity of this and the biodiversity that was lost with the loss of that. What is the outcome of this? So that's basically where I want to end up. Now, I do want to conclude with, I'll just summarize it. You know, um, Lao is in the middle. And Laos can learn, learn either the good points from China and Thailand or it could learn the bad points. It could end up uh, being covered in a carpet of rubber, protecting smallholder rights. It could end up being covered by a carpet of rubber with no smallholder rights, which would be the worst, taking from the worst from both examples. Or perhaps, and this is sort of what this slide's supposed to suggest, or perhaps ideally they could end up with diverse, equal, uh, diverse product lines like are being done in Thailand some of them which have commercial uh, value and where small farmers can continue to find a home. And this actually happening, of course, we all know is a real long shot, but policy will play an important role in getting us there. Thank you. We have a, a little bit of question time. Could, could we look at that second to last slide that you said you want to make a point on um, with the... Oh. With the green, no, no, with the, um, the graph thing. Oh, okay. Uh, back again. Okay. You mean the tie yeah. graph one, yeah. So um, I'm wondering how does mature forest, well, first of all, how is it defined there? What is the age of that forest? Is it the same in 1954 as it is in 2001? How does it increase that fast? Or is it just forest that's reserved? That's my question. No, these are actually village level maps and have been done using 54 data, aerial photos. Uh, I, I took all that out to make this short, but 60, 70, 80, 90, it's documented right through time. And so we could actually go out there and put an age on how much how it's increased, but uh, I, I took all that out. So it's not just this is not the reserve. This is, well, it is reserved and it's protected. They're not supposed to use it, but what we, how we got this data was mapping village lands, going out with them and mapping it, and seeing the change through time from Sweden to protected and, and, pro, and different types of crops. So what's the difference, what, what was lost by global life that there? Well, before, if it, I count personally all this as forest, this secondary Sweden, to me, because this regenerates into tree cover. So to me, we had 85% tree cover. And today, we're up to about 28%. So we've lost about 10% of the tree cover into this. And, and also, while the work has not been done, I mean, Christine could help without the rice biodiversity, but there was a lot, a lot of biodiversity associated with this. And we, you know, we've been talking about constructed landscapes. Well, this is a constructed landscape, and we know nothing, I think, about the biodiversity associated with this new tree cover, or very little. Um, in Laos, do they also consider the rubber plantations as forest? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> do you think there's any possibility that there can be pressure not to do that? I think it's a very evolving situation right now. Um, different governors, uh, Yao Yoi can speak to, the better than, to this better than I. In southern Laos, there's been real pressure, and the governors are allowing large scale concession. Problems much worse down there. Governors up here have tried to protect the smallholders, but have been under intense pressure. And Yayoi was just saying yesterday that it's beginning to be rephased and, and reframed, and who knows what might come out of it. Just really quickly, what's the rubber going to? I mean, in the Amazon, there's a real problem with rubber. Pri get markets, and the price is down, right? I mean, rubber, rubber prices. Rubber prices right now are at a world high. Um, um, you have to have some natural rubber. Again, I'm not a rubber expert, but I understand you need some rubber t for tires, both car and airplanes. And with Chinese market going crazy for cars, as well as producing all our tires, and India, don't forget, although they're not buying the China rubber, they're still part of the, in uh, the rubber market, uh, there's a huge demand for rubber. You cannot grow it commercially in the Amazon because of insects and pests, 
And the main producers of rubber in the world, of course, are Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, and China is like number five. And it, what we're really concerned about now, rubber, of course, has always been grown in the southern areas of Thailand and the more, more tropical areas. Now, the Chinese did the work to show that rubber can be grown in temperate areas. And it, we just got a new NASA project to map all the areas where it's going throughout northern Laos, throughout northern Burma. It's big in northeast Thailand. It will go into Chiang Rai. It is in central Vietnam. It's places it's never been before. And so we're interested in following that story. And that's the commercialization of the Swidden agricultural fields. We're going into a commercial crop. And that, to me, is the story of, main, of Southeast Asia, the conversion of Sweden, of the secondary forests associated with Sweden into commercial forms of agroforestry. Good, Christine, the last question here. I think you just answered it, and I don't think this is working. But in any case, um, this, this story about the crop, and I, I heard it once before about this mismatch between an Amazonian crop and this Asian monsoon. You mean the water, yeah, the water. yeah. Well, I mean, it's been grown for a hundred years in Southeast Asia very successfully. Is there something about it being moved yeah. farther north? Because yeah, it, it's because it's being moved further north. Because at the south, on the equator, you know, you have the year-round rainfall. There is more rainfall. Up here, we are in, we have a more pronounced dry season. It's, uh, and I'm not saying it's, got, we don't, one, we don't know the impact yet. We're just speculating. But two, um, if there is an impact, it's going to be at the end of the dry season. I mean, there's enough rainfall come monsoon to get you through the rest of the year, but it's going to be there in the dry season. And, um, and your first water availability for irrigation, your water for the cities, et cetera, might be impacted. We're going, the, the NASA grant will allow us to look at that more closely again, as well as carbon. Who knows about the implications of carbon? Thanks.